Hey, um, hi everyone. Happy, I don't even know what day it is right now, it's Wednesday. <laughs> um, I am the Director of Reading and Language at the Institute for Learning and Development. And um, I just really, simply I do three things. I work with all different ages. Um, my youngest student this year is six years old, just learning how to read. And then my oldest student is 27 years old and he has returned um, back to college. So I'm helping him through his um, associate's degree, super exciting. And then I also do neuropsych evals and then I do research with Michael and Elizabeth. And here I am, happy Wonderful. to be here. Uh, yeah, we're, we're very lucky to have Wendy with us for this webinar. I'm very excited about that. Um, if you've seen any other ones, you know, um, I'm Michael Greshler. I'm the director of the SMARTS Executive Function Program. Uh, like Wendy, I work with students, most of my students, middle school, high school, and college, working on those executive function strategies. Um, also, with SMARTS, we do a lot of great work on supporting teachers in public, private, and charter schools across the country. We love going out and doing trainings. We love doing trainings online and creating executive function resources for teachers, their students, you know, these days parents, um, and for students of all ages. So we're very happy to have you here today. Excellent, all right. So let's just give you a little lay of the land about who we are and what uh, SMARTS is. All right, let's continue, oh. excellent. Oh. Um, so these are, these are, this is our agenda for today, executive function and reading. We're gonna talk about why is executive function important, and EF difficulties and reading difficulties. Um, we're gonna talk about our highlighting activity, which is a terrific activity. Um, it's really, really great. Um, the kids like it and it's really, uh, it's really interesting. So that's something that is uh, something we really wanna make sure to share. So we're gonna talk about why kids are bad at highlighting a text, because there's really, um, a, a more effective way to use highlighting and a less effective way. And so you really, it's not just saying use highlighting, we're gonna tell you how. So we're gonna talk about per, <laughs> purposeful highlighting, uh, which is again, one of our favorite strategies. And then we're gonna talk about simple steps to integrate EF into reading. Okay, so the Research Institute for Learning and Development, just to make sure that it's all clear about who everybody is. So they are our parent organization. Um, they've been a leader in developing strategies around executive function um, with uh, students of all ages. And SMARTS really grew out of the Research Institute for Learning and Development. But uh, Research ILD also puts on conferences and trainings and lots of interesting things throughout the year. So you can check out a bunch of that information there at researchild.org. And then the Institute for Learning and Development, that is the sister organization to Research ILD. So uh, Research ILD is really about research and about developing curriculum for like large groups of students. Whereas the Institute for Learning and Development is more about one-on-one -on -one teaching and tutoring. So Wendy and Michael and many, many other people who also work for Research ILD also work individually with students. So if that is the sort of thing that you uh, are interested in and think you might need, you should uh, go to www.ildlex.org. Again, I will give you all these links uh, more in the future. So there's definitely overlap between them, but they are distinct entities. All right, SMARTS Online. So again, you're really here to talk about SMARTS. So SMARTS Online is a research-based strategy instruction curriculum that promotes lifelong strategic and self-aware learning. So SMARTS Online is a 30 lesson curriculum. And in fact, it's two curriculums because we have one that's specifically for elementary school and we have one that's specifically for secondary school. And it is really about teaching um, students executive function, but that also helping teachers be able to use our kind of tried and true strategies that are we have uh, been perfecting over years and years and years with research and then also using them in actual schools with actual students. Um, and so we're gonna talk generally about some of those strategies today, but in this uh, 30 lesson curriculum, you really get all the nuts and bolts and everything you need to teach it. Okay, so we've already sort of talked about this webinar series. This is number three of four. And the next one is Executive Function and Math. That's May 14th at 3.30. And uh, I have, we'll link you more to that. Again, that one is entirely free and we hope to see you there. 
Um, and then Dr. Lynn Meltzer is um, our president and director of uh, both organizations, Research ILD, ILD, and SMARTS is her baby. And uh, there's just there's just nobody around who has done more research and worked for uh, for decades in uh, in executive function. And she is also one of the ones who is teaching our uh, paid training workshops, along with Michael and myself. Uh, so that's just a little background on her. And she's written some great books. So ah, I always like go. to put a plug for those. That green Yay. book is my favorite. It's my EF Bible. Highly recommend okay. it. Highly recommend it's it. nice. The green book is really, really uh, concrete. It has a lot of strategies that teachers and parents even and students can use right now. Um, okay. And then the last, uh, the last thing is, uh, this is the training uh, that we, I was just telling you about, it's, it's those two, we're sort of saying this is a webinar, and uh, then we are also offering a paid training. So executive function, flexible thinking, resilience, reducing stress of distance learnings. So um, I am going to, again, I will, I will put these links in as we go on, um, but uh, that training is starting off um, on uh, May 19th, and we have a secondary school version and an elementary school version. Um, and that is going to be two sessions that are two hours each. Um, and then we are also giving you guys a promo code because we really appreciate uh, all of you being here for these webinar series. Um, I just put that in the chat. Again, I will put it in the end of this webinar and when we send out the email to you. Excellent. Don't forget. Oh, One yes, thing. yes, yeah. indeed. Last thing. Okay, so Master Your Mind. Master Your Mind is an ILD course. So this is a online course that is for students, distinctly for students. So if you have a student you think would benefit, who's a, well, this is really a middle school kind of, kind of curriculum, um, but uh, this is really a kind of like wonderful combination of what we do in SMARTS and then also what ILD does with sort of direct teaching um, to students. So let me put uh, the links to that. I'll put that also in the chat. Um, that is a, a, a paid training, but again, it is really distinctly from our teachers to students who need it. Yeah, that's a really unique course, and we're really excited to get that started next week. Um, okay, so now we're going to get into kind of the heart of today's presentation. If, you've, if you were here for our previous webinars, we spent some time really thinking about, like, what is executive function? Why is it so important for successful learning? And last time we had a really interesting conversation in how can we get both teachers and parents and students all on the same page when it comes to supporting executive function? So I encourage you to go back and watch those recordings. But today we're really gonna try to tease apart executive function with reading, which is one of the most central you know, academic tasks that there is, not only for students, but for adult lives as well. Um, so, like I said, we, we went into this piece a lot last time, but I just wanted to flash this up here to start, because when we talk about executive function at Research ILD, we have a very specific paradigm, Dr. Meltzer's paradigm, breaking it into organizing, goal setting, shifting, accessing working memory, and self-checking. Um, there's a lot of executive function paradigms out there, but when we talk to educators and parents and students, we want to make sure that executive function is all about concrete tasks and behaviors. So we love our neuroscientists, but we're going to really focus on these areas that are concrete and we can break academic tasks um, into one of these cogs. And also, so if you want to learn more about that, go ahead and watch the first webinar. But I also want to make that plug for metacognition. You cannot talk about it supporting students' executive function if you do not also talk about boosting their self-understanding. So as we get further into how EF and reading are interrelated, I want you to keep those two things in mind. How can we make executive function visible to our students and ourselves? And how can we use it to boost students' self-understanding, okay? All right, and then I'm gonna let uh, Wendy take it from here. Okay, so this is a, a real common question. You know, is EF, executive function, a part of reading? Um, is it a, a, a reading difficulty or is it an executive function difficulty or is it both? And, um, you know, as a kid learns to read and we do reading instruction, um, we're usually focused in on decoding. Um, and that's where strategy instruction is really explicit. About 80% of the kids who are referred to special ed, it's because of decoding deficits. And executive function strategy instruction is actually uh, overlooked 
Um, and so our charge today is to um, harness that, bring it in, and, and you can see how the reading instruction can be enhanced. So I'm on, right? My next Yeah, one? yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, so these are the big five. You all know this. If you're teachers and you're reading, reading teacher um, particularly, um, it starts with phonemic awareness. Um, it goes into phonics. Whoops, it went a little fast. I wonder if we can go back. I don't know if I can go back. There we go. Thanks. Um, and then there's fluency. That's uh, accuracy and rate. And then there's vocabulary uh, instruction with the ultimate goal of reading comprehension. So um, this is great as a starting point, but it's really the rope. Let's look to the next. We go into the next. There it is. The rope, I think, captures more of what um, is involved in reading. And you can see all these little strands and the bottom part of the rope talks about all that goes into just word reading. And the upper part of the rope talks about activating word meaning, making inferences, text structures. Um, what's missing in this particular iteration of Scarborough's reading rope uh, is fluency, automaticity. Um, this is 2001 and we're now we're in 2020. There's so much more that we know. We now know executive function is an integral part. Um, but can you imagine if one piece of strand of this rope is frayed, then the whole thing unravels. And, and it could be just a kid reading out loud and not stumbling over words, and the kid never wants to read out loud again. So um, we're gonna weave in a few more things in this rope. Let's go to the next piece. And this, this is yours, Michael. So what we're really interested in having you guys reflect on is what do you think your students can do independently? What can they do with guided support? And what's beyond their current abilities? You got this, exactly. Michael? Yeah, yeah, and feel free to jump in. I mean, I, sure. we're so lucky to have Wendy here. Anytime we talk about reading, I just ask Wendy. So now I, I have her here for all the questions. And feel free to type your questions in the chat, by the way. We will have time to pick her brain later. Um, we always like to put up this zone of proximal development when we talk about executive function, whether with reading or without. It's really important to think about how these skills develop. If we went back to that rope, you can see that as you get further down the rope, students are expected to be able to integrate and synthesize um, to accomplish more complex tasks. You know, you would never ask a six-year-old to read a journal article in a peer-reviewed journal. However, they are going to be building those skills to be able to do that one day. Um, so we like to try to trace out what is a reasonable expectation. This actually came out of, you know, we do these presentations and someone comes to us and they say, well, what should my kid be able to do? Uh, what should my students be able to do? And we like to kind of put that question back on the teacher or the parents, because a lot of that has to do with the context that a student is placed in. So um, Elizabeth, if you could paste in, I think we should have a, a Google survey for this. And we're going to ask you to um, kind of reflect on what should your students be able to do. Elizabeth, do you have that link? Or did I not? All right, there it is. So if you can cut and paste um, that Google link into your um, browser, I would appreciate it. If you're afraid of the tech, then don't worry about it. Um, but I'm asking you, are you able to see my screen? Can you see this, Wendy? I can see it, yeah. All right, good. So I'm going to ask you, what should a student be able to do? Should students who are five-year-old be able to identify relevant information in what they read when they're five, when they're nine, when they're 13, or when they're 17? Um, so let's kind of see if we all agree on those things, because that's kind of an interesting question. And, you know, are we all in agreement on what students are able to do? So I can see the responses are starting to come in. Let's see what they yeah. look like. So we can see at five, a lot of us are saying, yeah, they really can't identify what's relevant, right? They're going to focus on what's kind of interesting or silly, right? But look at that. Even from five to nine, we see a major shift. No one is saying a nine-year-old can't do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then as we get older, we're starting to see even more growth of 13-year-olds. Yeah, they can do that independently. And 17-year-olds, we're almost all of us are saying they can do that independently. Isn't that interesting, right? Um, now, 
sometimes, and I love it, you know, no one has put this in the chat, but I know people are thinking this, um, like, well, what about a student with dyslexia? Mm -hmm. What about a student who, um, you know, uh, is learning English and they aren't a strong reader yet? What about a student who had a really rough couple of years in school and is a little behind? So there probably are some gaps in those expectations. Even though we have some developmental expectations when it comes to reading, we know that not every student is in the same place. And I just, before I hand this back to Wendy, I want us to look at that CPD in a new way. So if you look down at the bottom in that green area, that's where those typical, you know, readers who are 17 are, right? They have the strategies to be able to handle the task, ideally, and they have the support if they need it. So they're independent. They say, this stuff is no problem for me. Um, when the strategies and the demands are in the same spot, when we're asking someone to do something that's kind of at the very edge of their abilities and we're teaching them the strategies to hand it, that's in that with support area, right? And look at that red. That's when the demands are exceeding the strategies and support. And that's when students are going to be overloaded. So even though we might have some pretty solid developmental expectations for our students, we should really watch where these areas are. Um, so I think, you know, the, the way that looks in reading is really interesting, but I'm going to let Wendy kind of walk us through the next piece. Well, I'm just going to add a little bit more to this. Um, just remember when you're focusing in on that red and when the level of support is, um, is not very much um, and the challenge is really high, it actually creates anxiety. So, so the can't do yet is anxiety. And then the independent if the challenge is not that much and the level of support is huge, then it's kind of boredom. So it's that sweet spot. And that's where, um, you know, this, this orange road here um, is exactly where we need to be. Not too, you know, difficult, not too easy, but, but just, just the right match. So I think I'm on, yeah? It's like two. Okay. Okay, so this should be really familiar to you guys, a decodable text, what are kids doing as, um, as young readers? And the text you can see is there's a lot of repetition, there's um, pictures, um, there's not many sentences. Um, you can tell this is focusing on short vowel sounds. And then, and the focus here is obviously learning to read. Then we move on to mid-level books, where the text changes. There's maybe a few um, pictures, but the focus shifts now to reading to learn. And I put in Kwame Alexander's book here because he has been so instrumental in getting uh, reluctant, struggling readers reading because he's writing in, in verse. And so that the text is not as taxing, but the interest is really, really high. So, um, and it's also adding more diversity. So I, I can't say enough about what he has helped and brought to our um, bookshelves. And then we have the upper level, level books. Um, now we have no pictures and the text is, is, is pretty um, small. Um, and the idea here is that analysis and synthesis, that's that, that upper end of that rope. Um, obviously, Romeo and Juliet, you know, is a very common high school book uh, that the text is, is really impossible to decode, even if you're a good decoder. So now we're all about inferencing. So, so what does it look like when the expectations have increased and the, um, the amount, it's sort of the volume what the kids have to do and the velocity um, at which they're being asked to do it. Uh, when that happens, then their executive function challenges are taxed. And we call this the clogged funnel. So all of us experience this, nothing's going through. And even right now with kids all learning online, I have a lot of kids that are just saying, forget it, it's, it's too much. Um, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And, and teachers are putting really good information out there, but it's, it's a lot because the English teacher is putting really good information and then they got to zoom in and do some, you know, even gym classes requiring them to do something. So it's, um, they, they just want to give up. They, they, they don't have um, a way of breaking it down. And this is what they look like, forget it. Um, so just think for a few minutes, what type of reading assignments do your students struggle with. And one thing that I, 
I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention it is this motivation piece. So something that we talk about a lot, and this is the expectancy value theory, where motivation actually equals expectation of success times valuing the task. So if a kid is a decent reader, then they feel pretty good about diving in because they have background knowledge and, and they remember, yeah, I know how to read this, but if they don't really care about it, maybe they don't care about the class, maybe they don't think the teacher even looks at the information, um, you know, they're gonna be less motivated to actually do it. Um, I will say this even happened with a parent. Um, so I work with a lot of students and then the, now we're working with parents and um, one parent was saying, you know, my kid just doesn't want to do this other homework. But I could really tell that she didn't value it and the kid picked up on that. So he didn't think he really needed to do it. So something that we need to be thinking about, we can't forget that, how we motivate our students. Um, all right, let's see. So reading comprehension, I really encourage you guys to do this. I ask my students to do this. If you have a blank piece of paper, uh, put reading comprehension in the middle. And we're going to do some spokes and try to figure out what does reading comprehension entail. It's not a single entity. And so these are the things that I come up with and I have this, the students do it. So one obviously is decoding. Are you a good reader? Do you have difficulty? What, what happens? What do you do when you come across an unfamiliar word? Do you know how to break it down into a syllable? Do you know syllabication rules? So that's the direct instruction. Vocabulary. Some kids really hate to read. They might have a really good listening vocabulary, but in print, they, they don't have that connection. Um, words the way they sound or the way they're pronounced are completely different. Segue, have you seen that written? It's totally different. So vocabulary is a huge part of reading comprehension. Processing speed. Um, how quickly do they process what they're reading? Um, you know, that some kids, I'm just a really slow reader, but by the time I get to the end, it just takes me forever. And that's very discouraging. Um, which would add to the lack of motivation. I don't feel like doing it, I'm not in the mood. And then another piece, obviously, can they attend to the task? Um, Romeo and Juliet, it's really hard to attend to if, if you have no background knowledge. So these are, you can see in purple, now what I'm gonna show you, and I'm sure you guys have some more, are all the executive function pieces. So I'm gonna start at the top, and this is text structures, genres, big picture. So a text structure, understanding the big picture of a piece of literature really helps the kid understand the organization. So organization is an EF process. How is this organized? And once they know how it's organized, they're going to have a better idea. Okay, now I understand. Even, even in terms of subheadings, you know, I encourage kids with the textbook. Go through it, do a little walk. How's it set up? What are the blue headings? What's not? Even chapters, are there chapter titles? Um, so text structure is really important. Um, clear expectations, is it manageable? So this is really goal setting. So here, you know, kids might say, okay, I have a goal if I wanna finish this chapter by, by Friday. Sometimes we as teachers actually look um, and, and we tell the kids, um, your goal is to read three pages by um, the next week. So sometimes the teachers are giving it and it's really clear. Some kind, we want the kids to actually start setting their own goals. So that's goal setting. Down here, multiple meaning words, drawing inferences, being able to shift. So sail, is it the sail on a sailboat? or is it a sale that is happening at a store? Some kids can't, they have a lot of difficulty with shifting. So yes, this is cognitive flexibility. So this is shifting mindsets, another executive function process. And then over here, we have background information. So this is where, you know, a lot of researchers in the reading field are saying, you know, we, this is really the, the, of the big five, this should be the fifth one kids need to have background information. It's like that Velcro to stick to. So the more they know about a text, the more they know about words, um, the more interested they are. Think about you, I know for me, if I'm reading a book and it takes place in Boston, I'm like, oh yeah, it's, so, it's familiar, it's comforting. Same thing even when we watch a movie, it's, it's like, oh, 
I, I, I get this, I'm connected. Um, and so one little thing I have kids do is, um, and this is another thing you can do with your students, say the word cat and ask them what comes to mind. And you'll get a variety of things. So for me, I get a really strong, scary cat with big talons because I, um, I don't love cats. Um, I have a kind of a negative association with cats, but somebody else who has, you know, a cat as a pet, it's this beautiful little, you know, um, purring orange kitty. And then I had one student said, well, I, I'm picturing a, um, a cat without any hair. I don't know, but there's an emotional piece that comes, but some other people, when they hear the word cat, they see C-A-T. So they're not visualizing at all. So there's nothing that they are holding on to. We want kids, when they read the word beach, they want to go to their favorite beach. So background information is critical. Um, and that is what we're talking about, accessing working memory um, and remembering. And then up here, we have reading fluency. So when the kids make an error, we want them to stop and self-correct. I would prefer for them to be accurate rather than fast. So that self-correction is really important. And so that is another EF process. It has to do with checking, regulating, even regulating like, huh, you know, I'm fading out when I'm, I'm reading this and I've just read this passage three times and I still don't know what it's about. That's, that's self-monitoring. So all these are part of a um, reading comprehension instruction and you can see how the two are integrated. So let's go to the next. And yes, it is a critical part of reading. All right, now we're going to do an activity. You're on, yes. Michael. This yeah, so fun. we're going to kind of take this and make this come to life. Because if we look at this, and then you think about that ZPD that we just talked about, think about how much more complicated this stuff gets. With Remember we talked about um, kids can identify relevant information. Think about how this looked as Wendy went through those different books. Think about how complicated that gets when you talk about text textures, genres. So we're going to do an activity to try to like simulate what can this feel like when we as educators are not doing a good job of supporting that developmental progression. So I'm going to show you a video. The video is called like the world's most expensive house. So you know, get ready for that. And I want you to go in the chat and I want you to, to write about it. So you got the chat, get your chat ready. I'm gonna show you a um, video of this house and I'm gonna be looking in the chat. I'm gonna be grading you guys on how well you, uh, how well you do. So let's see, give me one second to find my, okay. All right, are you guys ready? Here we go. Sound off intentional. Yes. <laughs> All right, you guys are doing a great job. Keep yeah. going. <laughs> what the heck is that claw thing? <laughs> Who is cleaning this house? <laughs> oh my gosh. These answers are excellent. I know you guys are doing an awesome, awesome job. Okay. So I'm going to give it like five more seconds on here. Uh, wow, you guys did a great job. Okay, hold on one second. Mm -hmm. I was hoping to get all your comments, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to. All right, let's just start here. <laughs> Who lives there? <laughs> Soulless. <Yeah. sighs> okay. Somebody said Jared would like to be in isolation. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, right. That would be an interesting place to be isolated. So now let's take a look. I'm going to try to make a word cloud out of what you guys did, because I'm like, you guys are all over the place. Let me see how we did. Let's take a look. Oh, it also had you guys' names in it. Um, let's see if we can pick out some. So the problem is that we, yeah, it's giving us, so like I see a couple of words in there, ornate, intricate, 
excessive, elegant castle. Um, I didn't have a way to take out your names, unfortunately, but I can still look at that. Want, uh, fancy, glamour, shapes, elaborate, large, stressful, complicated, palace, uh, stuffy, footage. Um, I think, you know, Karen Curlin did a good job. Uh, she had it in there. Everyone. Um, so nice, nice job, but but oh gosh, I'm not really getting a very good sense of this house from here. So I'm gonna have to say, I'm gonna give you guys a C minus. I see a lot of effort, but mm, I'm not really getting a sense of what I wanted, right? Now I kind of set you up. Okay. I know, it's kind of evil, sorry. I kind of mm -hmm. set you up to do poorly there though. And that's a really, that's kind of what we want to take away from this. Um, mm -hmm. Remember when Wendy showed you that motivation model? Um, what was it expected? Will you remind me, Wendy? Do you know off the top yes. of your head? Expectation of success times value. Good. So you, you expect that you're going to be successful. So you have good confidence and then you value it. You think it's really important. And when we think about how um, reading assignments get more complicated, more complicated, more complicated, I want you to think about executive function strategies as a way to help students expect to be successful and also to understand the end result. I just gave you this assignment and you had no idea what the end purpose was. And I also gave you a bad grade. So you, now you don't expect to be successful. You don't understand the point of it. We have to watch out for that. So we're going to look at um, highlighting. And highlighting is, I think, an area where we don't necessarily do a good job. Like we always ask, you know, are kids good at highlighting? Do they know how to highlight effectively? And I don't even need to see the chat right now to know the answer. Uh, no, <laughs> usually kids are not good at highlighting. We call this the yellow page syndrome, right? It's like they highlight everything on the page and you're like, look at it you know you need like 80 sunglasses just to just to like look at the page it's so bright which is totally not the purpose of highlighting right like kids actually like highlighting because it's a fun bright it. color but they don't necessarily know how to highlight okay and then you got this yellow page syndrome um, and you see this a lot when you ask kids to annotate a text for example right annotation what's the point of it I can't, I don't know how to do it. So we're, yeah, coloring. I see someone says, oh, you mean coloring, exactly. So we're gonna take a step back and we're going to teach you a strategy to help kids meet the demands of a highlighting activity so they can be more successful. Um, so we actually love, when I do this in trainings or with kids, I do exactly what we just did. We do a virtual tour. And by the way, you do not need to do um, the fanciest house in the world. You can do, you know, I've done, um, you know, those like, treehouse safari things in Africa, or those in, in French Polynesia and South Pacific, um, those like hotels that are on the water. You can do anything you want, but kids are just shouting things out, chandelier, chandelier, staircase, and you end up with this mess on the page, right? And so we say, well, the reason we didn't, we weren't able to highlight, we weren't able to pull out the juiciest stuff is we didn't really have a perspective. So when you approach a text, you really wanna know, what is my perspective? Who am I looking at this text, right? So we're gonna read, so in SMARTS, this is a SMARTS lesson, um, we talk about a house. We're gonna read a house as if we were a real estate agent, okay? Um, and you know, depending on the age of your students, you might wanna talk about what does a real estate agent care about, right? Um, you know, location, 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 the things that make the house worth a lot of money or the things that make the house need to be repaired, okay? And this is just the last um, page, um, last, last paragraph of the, document we use, and I am going to highlight it with you guys. So in the chat, um, wait, now I can't see the chat. I'm gonna find, first I'm gonna find the chat, and I'm gonna ask you to write a few things in there. What are some things that the real estate agent would like about this house? Good, I see eight bedrooms, that's a good one. What else, what else? So there's eight bedrooms. By the way, um, this I'm using the annotate feature in Zoom. You guys can all use this. Oh, who did that? Walk-in closet, oh, not me. Hold on. Okay, let's try that again. So we got eight bedrooms, walk-in closet, nice. New bathroom, yeah, I could use one of those. Newly installed bathroom, great. Um, chandelier, where's that one? Not so any. bad at like reading on uh, hole in the roof. Oh yeah, hole in the roof for sure. Okay, that's, so let's stop with that one. Let's just stop right there for that. So I see someone doing portable Xbox, which is kind of funny. I don't know if you could sell a house with the Xbox, but let me just read what I highlighted. 
eight bedrooms, walk-in closet, newly installed bathroom, and a hole in the roof. So you know what that sounds like? That sounds like one of those little ads that you might see advertising a house. Mm -hmm. And now you as the buyer know exactly what to expect. And there's a little bit of a price on there. Oh yeah, third floor playroom, that's a good one. Yeah. So we highlighted that with a great perspective. I know exactly um, what I'm getting into. I've pulled out the important things for my perspective. And we're going to take it one step further, and we're going to add a new perspective, all right? So I always like to, I know there are some smart educators on this webinar, but I wonder, what is the next perspective that we're going to have? So smart educators, don't you put that in there. I know you guys know. Um, we're going to be a private investigator. So I'm going to go back, okay, and I'm going to read this another time. And I'm going to use a different color. I'm going to go to my annotate menu and I'm going to pick, oh, let's do yellow this time. Yeah, so Elizabeth said thinking thief. We used to do thief, but then we're like, mm, that's not very socially, you know, pro-social. Let's do a detective who's going to catch a thief. So looking at this paragraph again with a new perspective, what are the things that the detective cares about? Yes, I see jewelry. Oh, sorry, that's a thin one. Jewelry. Um, furs, who even has furs anymore, right? Safety deposit box, great. Um, there's that Xbox, right? Uh -huh. Good. And the hole in the roof also, I love that. That one you can highlight for both and actually fire escape while you're at it, right? Uh -huh. um, so now I'm just gonna read what I highlighted as the detective. Furs, safety deposit box, jewelry, portable Xbox, hole in the roof near the fire escape. So now you know what that sounds like. It sounds like a detective in one of those shows who has that little notebook in, in their pocket and they're like, mm-hmm, filing their police report. So notice, same text and different perspective. And I use my perspective to grab what I needed from the text. So I'm going to erase my annotations, but um, thank you guys so much for doing that with me. It's really a great activity. And I've done this with kids as young as nine. I've done this with you know, college students and I do it with adults all the time in trainings. And it's so interesting to hear them explain their reasoning. Um, one time, this is a different uh, part of it, but there was like a newly painted room and the girl had highlighted um, the detective cares about the newly painted room. And I was like, no, I don't think that's true because that's something the real estate agent cares about, not the detective. And she said to me, well, what if they painted over all the evidence? And I was like, mm. oh my gosh. You know, that's critical thinking 101. But if we give students the tools to be able to document their thinking as the tasks get harder, we've given them strategies to handle those complicated tasks. Um, you know, this is what I want a page to look at. I love those different colors as a way for students to break down a task and use a strategy to tackle the tasks that get harder and harder. You know, when I have kids who have to annotate a novel, guess what? They don't like it. Mm -hmm. You know, shocking, right? But think about that um, formula that Wendy gave you. They don't expect to be successful because they don't even know what the, the teacher wants. You know, the English teacher, and I do, I love English teachers. Um, you know, I'm an English teacher at heart sometimes. Um, they were like, oh, highlight what interests you, highlight what excites you. You know, that's not speaking the student's language. But if instead we say, you're going to have to do an essay on this. So highlight quotes, highlight new characters, highlight, you know, themes that go to what we talked about in class, right? If we give them different colors for those things, then they know what it takes to be successful. And they also understand the end point of the assignment. So they're more motivated to use the strategy to handle um, tasks that are harder. So we've seen purposeful highlighting on um, you know, main ideas and details when you're summarizing, um, new vocab words. I love to use different colors for things I don't understand yet. Um, you can use them in math to highlight the different parts of a math problem. So, you know, kids like highlighters because they're colorful. So, you know, if kids want to use them, let's give them a strategy to use them meaningfully. You know, we, back in my office, which I miss, um, Wendy and I kind of swap back and forth. We have like a giant bag of highlighters. I swear there are 50 highlighters in there. And if a kid says, can I use a highlighter? I say, no, you got to use two highlighters, right? Use those colors, use that purposeful highlighting. Um, here's just a couple examples of times we've applied it. This is actually from the third grade um, MCAS, which is the state um, assessment here. And so they're supposed to be breaking down this passage about Benjamin Franklin. And we're saying, okay, writer, inventor, statesman, and we're going to use different colors. So for writer, we're doing things in blue. For inventor, things in yellow. And for statesman, things in green. And by the way, these are the real colors that are part of the online assessment. So you know, they, they're, they're 
they're grading kids on computers now and they have this highlighting feature, but kids don't know how to use it. So this is a great strategy when you're doing um, those online assessments. And then they can use these questions to go back and look for evidence that they highlighted to answer the question. So I love this, you know, uh, guess what? Kids don't always find these reading tests very fun, but if we give them strategies to use these tools, they can be more motivated on them. Um, Wendy, I think this is one of your examples, sure. right? Yeah, so this is a high school student who is um, required to read things they carry. And this, I mean, I just literally did this with a student last week um, and talk about lack of motivation. She said, forget it. You know, she just finished reading Great Gatsby, but, you know, there's a movie to, with Great Gatsby and she loved it. But this, she had no background knowledge. And so um, I use purposeful highlighting to give her the big picture. So we did this simultaneously. This is in a Google Doc. So on there, there's highlighting. And um, what we did is we shared the reading because she's dyslexic. So reading isn't her favorite thing to do either. So I read the first paragraph and, and then we just thought like, so what, what do you think was the essence of the first paragraph? And he said, well, there's a lot about love and, you know, um, false hope. And maybe this, this Jimmy Cross guy likes this Martha, but she doesn't like him back. And so she decided to use pink because that, you know, reminds her of love. And so she highlighted the things that um, emphasized what this paragraph was about. And then you can see she chose a different color um, for, for this second paragraph because it's completely different information. So really fun to do, easy to do. You can, um, get a copy of the, the plot summary. You can even go to um, Sparknotes and copy it into a Word doc, Google doc, and do it simultaneously together. Um, super helpful. She felt so much better after. Now, granted, I, I just want to emphasize this doesn't, doesn't replace reading the, the entire book. The book is so much more detailed, but it just gave her a little Velcro to stick to. Um, this next one here, a little bit more, um, you know, back to paper. Um, I also did this with a student online, and um, up front, I asked him, We're gonna look for the causes, and you're gonna underline those in blue, and then we're gonna look for the effect, and we're gonna underline those in yellow. So, we actually did this simultaneously, and I had him number the paragraphs just so we could talk, like, Hey, what'd you see in first paragraph? He's like, I don't really see anything in there. It's kind of an intro. Yeah, now we're looking at like text structure. How about the second? Well, a little more effects. And then lo and behold, the fourth paragraph was all about the, the causes. And so I love that after we did this, he realized it was the way that it was written, which is really a reflection of writing. And so um, it was helpful for him to, again, get a big picture in a different way. This is factual information. And moving on. So we want you guys to leave with, you know, some simple steps. You're already doing a lot and um, we want to see how we can just make it just clearer for you in four simple steps. So keeping these in mind, these are EF strategies, processes. Uh, the very first thing is clearly you need to provide clear directions. So Michael gave you that, you know, the tour of the house with absolutely no directions. He's like, here, this, you he actually said it was for sale, but here, just go ahead. And, you know, it was willy nilly. He, you didn't really know what to write down. If you had said, or we had said, um, we want you to look at this house and look at the features, look at the fancy features. This house is being sold. What are some features that are really appealing to you? And clear, clear directions. Um, I will also say when I'm giving directions now, even more importantly, um, is to do the bullets because when kids see a paragraph, they can't break it down. Now, high school kids, they may see a paragraph of directions, um, especially for an essay. It's really important that we encourage them to number it so they know all the things they need to do for a particular assignment. So clear directions. Setting up a realistic goal. Um, again, clear expectations. I, I had a student do some research and I thought he could get 10 things. I thought that was realistic. And he came back, he's like, no, I'm only doing five because that, that's better for me. And he was right, that it was new to him to research something, so five. But it's sometimes, you know, actually labeling um, and putting a number to it is very calming. Like, oh, I only have to do five pages. I only have to do one um, chapter. Um, okay, moving on. 
So, so far we have clear directions and we have clear expectations and then actually teach the strategy. So Michael walked you right through, we showed you explicitly how to highlight the things. Do it with the kids. We can do it simultaneously online with all our highlighting tools, um, which is actually a benefit. Um, I always say verbalize what you're doing, kind of those, those that think cloud. Hmm, let's see. What should I highlight here? Just talk out loud. Um, and I also really think it's important to show non-examples. Just like Michael showed you the yellow pages, this is not what we want it to look like. That's too much. Um, and then lastly, this is probably the most important. This is to be uh, flexible and reflect. Did that work? Did it not work? What would you want to do next time? And allow for that discussion. Um, if you, allow the kids to choose it it gives them ownership it gives them autonomy and that is the most important thing i'll give you a little um snippet my husband just retaught me how to play cribbage and he plays it all the time and when he was trying his directions were all verbal and he said well you need to do this and we need to cut the deck thin to win and i said can you stop can we just start playing so i think that's something that's really important too you have to pause and who who is on the receiving end what kinds of way do they uh need to be given directions maybe a demonstration is more valuable than a, a lot of words um so i always like because i like to remember things in an acronym i move these these beginning letters around and what it comes out to is dress so there you go dress for success so the d is the directions clear directions the r reflect all the time reflect and be flexible um the e clear expectations and the s strategy instruction so um there you are and here we are Question. excellent um, so we're going to spend a little time, we, so people have been putting some great questions in the chat, so continue to do that. Um, we're going to take about five or six minutes for questions, and then Elizabeth is going to kind of uh, take us out, um, you know, with the, how to tell you how to get your certificates, etc. So a couple questions were on um, the, you know, is this from the curriculum and how much of this is in the curriculum? So, you know, the everything you saw when we started talking about highlighting, the purposeful highlighting, all of that is in the curriculum. So one lesson comes with a lesson plan for the teachers, the handouts for the students, as well as a PowerPoint you can use to model and guide instruction. Um, so all of that was in there. The lesson plan actually said, someone said, well, what about this stuff that Wendy's telling us right now with the four pointers and this and that? So that was developed for this webinar specifically. But, um, you know, we do start every lesson plan with what we call the one pager. It has key definitions. So you as the teacher are kind of up to speed on what is the EF research and theory that supports this lesson? What are best practices, et cetera? Um, the curriculum itself is, as Elizabeth mentioned, it's 30 lessons. We have elementary and middle school, high school. So it's a K-12 EF solution. The curriculum is modular. You can pick and choose different lessons to customize for the, you know, students and the setting, you know, whether you're doing a special ed, you know, resource skills class, or you're a, you know, English or a social studies teacher, uh, etc. Um, you on the evaluation, you'll have uh, the ability to kind of say, yes, give me a sample lesson. So you can see what this looks like, whether you're interested in elementary or secondary. The free lesson is actually a time management lesson. It's not the this wonderful reading comprehension one. But I encourage you to check it out. If you have more questions on anything related to EF, definitely um, contact us. Let me actually switch this over so you can see our emails so we can reach out and be friendly that way. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to talk about SMARTS all day long, but let's make sure we get to some of the reading ones. I do wanna, one more question that was actually reading related and SMARTS related. Um, one of our wonderful SMARTS teachers uh, who is on this webinar said, well, what about Skim and Scoop? You should teach these together. So Skim and Scoop is another one of the awesome reading strategies that we took it, and we took Wendy's brain and we just went like this and we put it into the curriculum. I love Skim and Scoop. It's a strategy to um, quickly summarize main idea and, and details and they do go very well together. Um, so what I'll say about purpose 
successful highlighting, it's a great one to start with. And then build more strategies on top of that. Because if you're doing a skim and scoop and you're talking main idea and details, why not do those in different colors? Or if you want to do a summarizing um, of a fiction story strategy, why not use different colors? Purposeful highlighting is a great gateway into um, reading strategies across the board. Do you agree with that, Wendy? Anything you want to say on that I do. One? And, and you know, the one um, about the earthquake, uh, we actually were doing a little skim and scooping because after things were highlighted, we we put, uh, you couldn't really see, but there were some uh, words in the margin. Um, so it, it was a combination of both. Uh, somebody also mentioned um, SQ3R. That's a really great one to, um, too, to survey something and read and um, ask questions. I think that's helpful. Um, background knowledge is massive. Uh, that's, that's really, um, if you can spend a lot of time creating information about the setting, about even the author, because the author is usually sharing a piece of his or her life within his, um, the stories written. That's really important. I see somebody else saying visualizing and verbalizing. And that, that was my whole idea with the cat. Like, if, if, you know, you're going to pull up all sorts of things or maybe pull up nothing. So visualizing, verbalizing is um, very, very helpful. That's who Linda Mood um, Bell. And um, yeah, we would have put skim and scoop in here, but we just thought it was too much. Right, and yeah, yeah. tried to make it a little more pithy. Um, um, somebody else mentioned oh, sorry, go ahead. That I didn't put in um, the acronym DRESS. We can add it, and um, so there will be one more slide that we can add, so you'll sure. get that. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so there was another question that, well, there's two questions that got kind of buried. So one is about reading on screens. So Wendy, yeah. do you have any thoughts on, on that? Because, and I actually don't really like to read on screens, but uh -huh. it's also unavoidable these days, and we probably should be preparing kids to do it. So what do you think about um, strat like how to integrate with reading on screens? Any, any tips for that? Well, um, with this, the high school student, you know, I shared it. So um, okay. I read a paragraph, she read a paragraph. So, um, and usually um, if I'm reading out loud, then the student needs to come up with a summary of that paragraph. So they're not being asked to do two things at one time. And then um, if they're reading out loud, I'll actually say, hey, this is what I think that paragraph's about. So it's a, it's a combination. Um, you know, I have a lot of students right now, if I have the same book, that is ideal. But I will tell you, um, when one part of your senses is blocked off, there's another part that's heightened. So an example is when you're only hearing the story um, and you don't have the visual, I have found that sometimes kids are, are more tuned in. Like I had a student who, um, I didn't have an opportunity to copy and send her the pages. And I said, okay, I'm gonna read the, the, the chapter. Your job is to draw a picture. And um, she's like, I, just, I don't know what I'm going to draw. And I said, well, you, you want to pause until you have a picture in your mind. And she did an amazing job. So that was the fourth grader. Uh, so it's, it's being flexible, honestly, yeah. and, and creative. Um, um, I definitely have to say about that as well. So I, I am a digital person. I like audiobooks and I like yeah. reading things on screens. And I think that, again, so almost every screen reader, just regular PDFs, everything, you can highlight on them. You can annotate them, you can mark things. And that what's great about that, and what I like to stress with kids is that, I don't know if your students are like this, but for me, if pieces of paper come into my life, they disappear. Whereas you can mark up everything on a digital text and it'll stay, you're not gonna lose it. Um, so that's really helpful. Also, I also agree that audiobooks can be great because you can fidget during them. Like you can draw, you can be doing something else, you can be, sometimes it's much easier to focus in um, when you actually have your hands busy. So like that's something that, uh, you know, you really, it's like Michael actually says all the time, you know, you have to make the strategy work for the specific student. And sometimes that means trying a few things. Yep, yeah, absolutely. one thing I'll add, I'll add into that is, uh, and Michael mentioned this before, a lot of teachers ask the kids to annotate, and that's so nebulous, they, because they, they don't really know. And um, one student said, you know, I, I was reading, and she stopped, and she said, wait, and I need to annotate. Well, what, what are you annotating? 
oh, it's it's a kitty and I love kitty. So I'm going to just put a little smiley face next to it. Um, and it actually disrupts the fluency. Um, so I really encourage people to read a chunk and then discuss. And what I like, my favorite thing after a, you know, a couple chapters, even if you do individual chapters, write down one fact, write down one question and one inference. So the fact can be anything, mm. anything that they pull from that chapter. The question propels them to, to you know, go forward and learn more. And the inference, we, we really need to be using that language because I think it seems, and, and why do you think that? You know, back it up with evidence. Okay, so um, we're just about out of time. So I want to make sure that Elizabeth has time for the end of webinar spiel. But also just thank you so much to Wendy for making herself available for this. I mean, thank just you. such a treasure trove of reading stuff. Like, you know, anytime I have a question, I'm like, Wendy. So <laughs> uh, that's really wonderful. And don't forget, this will be up on the YouTube. You can like learn from this, you know, for years to come. Um, you know, we really love hosting these EF resources. Executive function is always so critical to successful learning, but even now it is more important than ever. So thank you guys for taking the time to join. So Elizabeth, will you kind of give us the um, send off and we hope to hear from all of you, you know, soon in the future. We hope to see you again. Okay. So the most important thing uh, for this moment is the evaluation form, which I've put in the chat. Uh, I'll put it in again. Why not? Um, so again, we really, 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 really appreciate you filling it out because we just want to make sure that these uh, webinars are the best they can possibly be. Also, if you um, need an email that says that you uh, were here for this webinar, you have to fill out the evaluation to get that. Um, so you will get the email um, in any case if you fill out the evaluation. However, if you need a certificate, sort of an official thing, um, just you can mark that on the evaluation and uh, then we will email you and that will cost $15. Um, but, uh, but really we, we want the evaluations very, very much because we wanna make sure that we are making our next webinars as good as they can be. And speaking of our next webinars, how do we like that segue? Okay. Um, so the next webinar in this series, the last one um, is executive function and math. So picture this webinar, but for math. Um, so that gambling is absolutely free. There's a link, it's up there. Um, and it is on May 14th. We will send you all of these links, don't worry, in the email that is going to be coming uh, soon that has the video of this webinar in it. However, I do also want to let you know about, I'm gonna give you two more things for, uh, that we really, really wanna stress, is that we are having our second um, executive function training. Um, and that is going to be, I'm gonna put it in the chat right here. Um, so that is uh, executive function, flexible thinking and resilience, reducing the stress of distance learning. Uh, so there are two sections of that, elementary and secondary. Each one has two lessons that are two hours long. That'll be with our director, uh, Lynn Meltzer and Michael, and then me playing the role that you see me doing now. Um, and this one is you get uh, four strategies um, as well. So that's whole lessons. And then we teach you how to teach them. So this is really intensive. Like what you've learned today is very much an overview of executive function, strategies, and smarts. This one is very much, uh, very, very focused. Um, and uh, we also have a, uh, and yes, we will email you these links for sure if you're having trouble opening them. Um, and, but there is a promo code for that, uh, for that training. It is BeFlexible2020. It's good for $20 off, but it's only good until May 8th. Um, and then for a few people, we had a few parents in this, um, and I definitely want to make sure that we highlight the ILD Master Your Mind series. It starts the fifth. It is for uh, middle uh, middle grades. Let me make sure I'm actually putting this in the chat to everyone and not just to one person. Uh, there we go. And that is a class that we usually have a Master Your Mind in person with a group of students. So this is going to be a class for students Exactly. And so this is something that could be really good. Again, we have students who are at home who are not having regular classes. And we have parents at home who are trying to do their jobs at the same time. So this is something we really, really felt was important to put out there so that uh, we can keep our students learning over the summer and now. Um, and again, you can follow that. It's got a lot more information. Um, and if these ones go well, we're considering doing more in the future. Um, and then if you have any interest in the entire SMARTS curriculum, you can email us 
And uh, that also, I just wanted to make sure that yeah, that's 30 lessons. Um, there is the free lesson that Michael mentioned is uh, fantastic and it is really gets the idea of what SMARTS is. So if you have a lot of those types of questions, I recommend going to the website, downloading that, have it, use it, enjoy it. Um, and uh, okay, um, so let me, uh, so the training sessions uh, is, let me make sure you go in there. Um, so Michael, the training is, uh, is that $185? Um, no, I think that the two hour, the cognitive flexibility trainings, um, they're a little shorter than the ones we just did. So I believe it's $99. Okay. Um, we will, so, so I do want to be respectful of people's times. I also got to go tell a student what to do. Uh, and, you know, that you have coaching. I can stay on and answer these specific okay. questions. Okay, yeah. that's fine. You're the host. So, I don't mind. Um, but everything's on the evaluation form as well. You can check that you want the free lesson. We can, we can get you whatever you want. So Wendy and I, I guess let's sign off um, okay. and we'll get you your follow-up email later. Elizabeth, thank you so much. Thank you yes. all for Thanks. joining us. Thank you know, you. everyone stay safe, but also boost that executive function, reach your kids, get those strategies in there. Yeah. Uh, we look forward to hearing from all of you soon. Yes, thank you. Right. And yes, that training is $99. Sorry, we have a lot of stuff we want to tell you. And so my document's a little cluttered. Um, right. So yes, Hi guys. excellent. Well, thank you so much. And again, yeah, I will put as many of those in and answer as many